I wanna talk to you today about the most important question that you'll ever answer in life. And I understand that's a little bit of a bold, strong statement, but I really believe that what we're going to dig into today is absolutely the most important question and you are answering it with your life. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us today. I hope he reminds you of some things or reveals some things in you, does a work in your life as much as I care deeply for every one of you and your circumstances and situations, the opportunities that lie before you maybe the opposition that you're walking through, as much as I care as your pastor, let me just tell you, God cares even more because you're his child. And so I'm gonna pray corporately over us, but right where you are, man of God, right where you sit, woman of God, in this room, those joining us online, would you ask God to speak to you about your unique circumstances and situation, what he wants to do in you today? And Lord, that's our prayer. That's our prayer. We invite you. We want to do more today than have church. We want to encounter the living God, Lord. And we say we're here to hear from you, God. We want to grow in our faith, Lord. Any of us who are here today who might be weak or weary or hurting or wounded or dealing with doubt, God, I thank you, Lord, that today you're able to use one message to speak individually and uniquely to every person, every marriage, every heart, every mind, every circumstance, every situation, God. And so we invite you, we honor you, we welcome you, Lord. I thank you, God, today that you would use an imperfect message prepared by an imperfect person to in a new way, in a greater way, just continue to reveal the heart of a good father. We, we honor you, we welcome you, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, and come on, if you'll receive any or all that for yourself, give the Lord a big amen. All right, Matthew chapter 16, and in verse 13, we pick up Jesus talking to his disciples. And it says this, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, and here's the most important question that you'll ever be faced with, and you're, you're answering it, the most important question you'll ever face, and you're answering it with your life today. And he says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And he says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who do you say I am? And Peter got it right. Here's the thing we know is that Peter was not the rock. We know Peter was up one day and down the next, right? Peter was anything but a rock. The rock was the revelation of who Jesus really was in a culture that had varying opinions about who they thought he was. And the same is true today. All kinds of perspectives and opinions about who Jesus is to people. Some see him as a religious icon. Some see him as a moral figure. But but Peter got it right when he said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You're the one whom the Father sent to rescue us, to forgive us, to heal us, to restore us back into a relationship with our heavenly Father. Many perspectives, there's one God, one Jesus, many perspectives about who he is. And how many of you remember, I think it was a few years ago, you remember seeing that shoe that was being shared all around social media? And and some people would look at the same shoe and they would see a pink and white shoe. You remember, it kind of looked like a little skater shoe, like a van shoe or something with the stripe on it. How many of you remember seeing that? And some people would see it and they would see a pink and white shoe. Other people would see the very same shoe and they would see it as teal and white. One object seen differently by different people based on their perspectives. The other day I I was hanging out with my kids and they were showing me these images, these like illusions and these images that if you look at it from one perspective, like one of them that they were showing me from one perspective at a glance, you saw an elderly woman. But if you kind of kind of glossed your eyes over a little bit or kind of stared intently on it, you would see a beautiful young woman. And so one picture, one image, differing perspectives. And the same is true about God. Many different perspectives, many different answers to the question, who do you say I am? And the answer that you give will reverberate throughout eternity. 
And you'll only grow as close to God as your revelation of him will allow you to. How do you see God? Th through what lens, through what filter do, do, do you see God? You'll only grow as close to him as your revelation of him will allow you to. You'll only go as far with him as your revelation of him will allow you to. In other words, if you see God because of the perspectives that have been formed in your life, if you see him as distant, unfair, legalistic, uncaring, there's a barrier that's introduced into your life that limits your ability to truly know him and trust him and that, that allows your lives to really be anchored to the reality of who he really is. Because how many of you know this? Who we think God is doesn't change who he really is. It just changes our ability to do two very important things, to relate to him and to receive from him. Because Malachi 3 verse 6 says, he is the Lord and he does not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So don't be attracted by strange new ideas. That's Hebrews chapter 13. In, otherwise, in other words, there's not a modern version of Jesus in skinny jeans. <laughs> the same God that you read about all throughout the Bible, who was just, who was powerful, who moved in miracles, he's the same God that invites you to a relationship with him through the cross of Jesus Christ today. And so... Who do you say that Jesus is? And how does that answer cause you to relate to him and receive from him? How I see God doesn't change the reality of who it is. It just changes my ability to relate to him and receive from him. There are many contributing factors to misconceptions or inferior perceptions about who God is. And, and here, so there's a lot of different things that have happened to people that cause people to have, again, an inferior perception about who God is. But I would submit to you that two of the primary things, two of the main factors that cause people to have an inferior perspective of who God is, an inferior answer to the question of who do you say that I am, would be these two things. Misrepresentation about the character or nature of God through bad teaching or religious traditions. In other words, just the way that we've talked about God, the way that we've presented God to people has ca caused God to see, man, if that's who God is, I'm not sure I want any part of that. And this other thing, and that's this, is that painful, unforeseen, unexpected, or unfair experiences or unfulfilled expectations in life with our earthly fathers or authority figures. The lens through which we see our heavenly father can be affected. In fact, I, I, I wanna say it more strongly. It has been affected by those things in your life, whether you know it or not. But by, by the way that God's been presented to you and, and by the things that have happened to you, the lens through which we see our heavenly father is, is affected by those experiences. And, and so I don't know what your parents were like. There's a wide spectrum I was blessed to have really good godly parents who had committed their lives to God, who were raising us in the church, who were reading the Bible in our house. They, but here's the thing, is, as, as good and godly as they were, they, they, they were imperfect because here's the thing is, there's no perfect parent. As good and godly as they were, there's, there's, there's always flaws that we bring to the equation, every one of us. So I, I was blessed to have good and godly parents, but there's a whole other end of the spectrum that maybe some of you, unfortunately, had to face in life with parents who were maybe abusive or, or, or neglected you, who, who said things that, that still caused pain and hurt, or maybe who didn't do things that you really desperately needed to be said or to be done in your life to help you to form the character or be and become the man of God that God has in his heart for you to be and become, or the woman of God. And so th there's, there's this wide spectrum, and unfortunately, some of us had parents who were maybe absent or distant. So, some even, unfortunately, and my heart goes out to you, had parents that were maybe even physically or, or verbally or emotionally or even sexually abusive to you. Some experienced parents that were controlling or angry or overly strict, he harsh or heavy handed in the way that they would discipline you. Some of us had parents maybe that were workaholics and it skewed kind of the way that we approach life and the way we see God. Or maybe you had parents who were maybe slothful and they were not 
diligent at providing for you and your family. Maybe you had parents who were unwilling or unable to fully express love and affection to you. That's a real common one. Or, or, or maybe you experienced, you only experienced performance-based love and affection. In other words, when you were making the grades or making the teams, there was love and affection. But if you stumbled or failed or didn't make the team or didn't make the grade, there was kind of a shrinking away or, 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 or a hesitancy to fully express love and, and, and affirmation and, and pride. So here's the thing that I want to encourage us with is that regardless of where, and I'm not trying to judge things up, whenever God reveals something, he wants to heal something. And, and here's what I understand is that Whatever doesn't get healed up by God almost always gets handed down. And so we got to be real with God and allow him to get into these places that have caused us or influenced or affected the way that we see God. So let me just encourage you with some things as it regards this, with the understanding that there's a wide spectrum of experiences that we've all experienced. And here's a few truths that apply to every one of our situations. And here, let me encourage you with this. Our imperfect parents were largely a product of their imperfect upbringing. And when we realize this about them, it can help us to have grace for them. And, and even as we're kind of aware of some of the shortcomings or the, or the imperfections, I wanna encourage you with this, that we can find a way by God's grace to honor our father and mother. And we must, Ephesians 6 says, honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with the promise that if we do this, it'll go well for us and we'll experience a long life. So, so let's commit ourselves to realize that they had imperfect upbringings themselves. We can have some grace for them and realize that we need to find a way to even be able to express honor even in the midst of their imperfections. Number three, encouragement for, for how to deal with this is we have to understand that our responsibility is to forgive. Did you know that forgiveness in the life of a believer is not optional? Colossians 3 verse 13 says, make allowance for one another's faults. Forgive anyone, say anyone. Amen. Forgive anyone who offends you. And then watch, he says, remember the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. You might say, Pastor T, you just submitted and confessed that you had good godly parents. You don't understand. You don't understand what it was like in my life. And, I, and I'll, I'll meet you there and say, I, maybe I don't. But here's what I know and here's what I've learned and here's what I've seen time and time and time again. That there is no pain, there is no circumstance, there is no situation, there is no loss, there is no past, there is no history, there is no relationship. There is nothing that is beyond the reach and the power and the ability of the blood of Jesus Christ to bring healing, freedom and redemption and restoration into that situation, into that circumstance. God is able to heal and restore. Nothing is beyond the power of his love. Lastly, our heavenly father is good. And he's the only one that can truly feel and, and fully heal that place in our heart where there were those unforeseen, unexpected things, unfair things, hurtful things. Th again, things that were, that were committed to you, things that were said to you, the hurtful things, or the things that you really needed to be done the dad that you needed to love you to keep you on the right track. The, the, the dad that you needed to correct you in love to kind of keep you moving the right direction. The things that were done and the things that were not done. Only God can fully fill and truly heal that place in your heart with his love and with his affirmation. O only him. I have a friend in ministry. His name is Dr. Graham Caddo. Some of you know him. And I was sitting in a conference setting where he was sharing a word and he was talking about a time where he was sharing a message very similar to this. He calls it first the father. And we'll dig into that here in a little bit, how there are many roles, many functions, many descriptors that the Bible gives about who God is, but that I'll show you in God's word that, that the motivating factor for him being all those things, creator, master, judge, ruler, savior, that he's all those things, but he's first the father. And Dr. Graham tells a story about sharing a message like that and as he was expounding upon the goodness of God and contrasting it with some of the pain that we experience in, in earthly relationships. He shares the story about how a woman towards the back of the room leapt to her feet and began to curse God using pro, the most vile, profane language, cursing him, 
saying, that is not the God that I know. And she went on and on. You can imagine the tension in a room of Christian believers and leaders, you know, as they kind of all looked around like, where's the security guy at or whatever, you know? Who's gonna do something about this? And what do we do? Dr. Graham says they just kind of, there was just a grace just to allow her. There was all this pain and hurt that had been shoved down in her that was coming out. And obviously it was ungodly, but in that moment, there was a sense that she was dealing with something, that she was, something was coming out of her that had hindered her and held her back even though she had been in the church for many years and even though she was a leader in that church, even though she was attending the Saturday session of a conference that was even more than what would be expected of her on Sunday mornings, that she had all these experiences that had caused her to have a different perspective or lens about who God was than what other people were seeing for themselves. Dr. Graham tells a story that there was just kind of a grace to just let it kind of run its course. After a minute or two, she kind of slumped down into the chair in the back of the sanctuary and just began to sob as other church leaders surrounded her and began to lay hands on her and just minister to her and pray for her. Dr. Graham says it this way, as the woman was just profaning God with the most vulgar language, he said that in his heart, he was asking God what to do. And he said, God, as she was profaning you, all I sensed from you was love for her. And he said, God, how could that be? And Dr. Graham shares that the Lord spoke back to his heart and said, It's because who she was profaning is the God she thinks me to be, not who I really am. How many of us, we we have a lens, we have a perspective, we've had experiences, unfair, unexpected, or unfulfilled, that cause us to see God differently than who he really is. And maybe we don't act out the way that that woman act out, but it actually has hindered or affected our ability to relate to God or receive from him. Our heavenly father is good and he's the only one who can truly fill and fully heal that place in your heart. With his love, with his affirmation, it's one of the greatest needs that we have in life, the love and affirmation of a father figure in our life. And it fits in the category of something that I say often, that anywhere where there's power, promise, or potential, you might as well predetermine to expect opposition. And so the enemy knows how powerfully important this is in our heart, this need to have the love and the affirmation of a father. And it's why he meddles in this. It's why he introduces strife. It's why he introduces divorce. It's why he causes those things to enter into our lives so that he can hinder us or hold us back from really fully developing into the man of God or the woman of God that God has in his heart for us to be and become. But here's what I want to encourage you with today is that regardless of how much of that you've experienced from earthly father figures and earthly authority figures, God is always waiting and looking to fill that place in your heart with his love and with his affirmation. Did you, do you remember when Jesus was baptized and John the Baptist had said, who, who am I to baptize you? And he said, it's gotta happen. You gotta baptize me. And Jesus was baptized in that river and you remember what happened when Jesus emerged from that, those baptismal waters in that muddy river. There was a voice, you remember, there was a voice that came from heaven in that moment. And do you remember what the voice is documented as having said over Jesus in that moment where he was stepping into his life's purpose? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God realized that even Jesus would need the love and the affirmation of the Father to fulfill his life's purpose, and the same is true for you and me. And isn't it interesting that that's what God would see fit to declare publicly over Jesus in that moment? Wouldn't the religious mind think that maybe there would be some different things that the Father would introduce Jesus to the world as in that moment? This is my Messiah whom I, who I've sent to save the world. This is a preacher. This is a prophet. This is the one that I've sent to redeem the world. There's a lot of different things that God the Father could have said over Jesus, but he knew that all those things were things that Jesus was called to do. And in the fullness of, of approaching those things, he understood that Jesus was going to need to know not just what he was called to do, but who he was, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And if you're here today and there's an absence, there's a void, there's an emptiness, there's a longing for in your heart, 
You need to hear something today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, is the forever unending, undefeated, fully completed statement of God's fullness of love and affirmation for you. The cross of Jesus Christ stands forevermore as a reminder that God loved you while you were still lost. And he came running after you. God knew that even Jesus would need this. If Jesus would need it, how much more do we need it? That, that moment that I just paraphrased for you, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased as Jesus was being baptized is Matthew chapter three. You turn the page, just one page over Matthew chapter four and Jesus is encountering Satan. And this is what he said to Jesus. He said, if you are the son of God, questioning that sense of identity, that relationship of, of, of son to father. And, and so don't forget that Joseph had actually been filling that role of earthly father to Jesus. And the reality is the truth for, for every one of us is that even the most, the most good and godly earthly father simply cannot fill this need for us entirely. Only God can meet this need. The love of the father towards you is unrelenting, undefeated, never ending. The cross of Jesus Christ is God's forever statement of affirmation and love of pursuit of your heart. And the love of the Father towards you is unconditional. And this speaks true, especially to those of us who maybe experience conditional love from earthly fathers or authority figures. The love of God is not performance based towards you. In fact, the Bible's real clear that the love of the Father towards you is actually magnified on your dark days and your worst moments. That that's the moment that he's expressing his love to you. We find it in Romans chapter five where it says this. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God, and I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for some but God scriptures in the Bible. But God, he says, you know, there's not many people who would die, lay down their life, even for a really good person. But God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. It's anything but conditional or performance-based. On your darkest day, in your time of need, that's when God saw fit to show you his love and send Jesus. He didn't send Jesus to establish a religion. He didn't send Jesus to establish a denomination or even build a congregation. He didn't send Jesus to make bad people less bad. He sent Jesus to rescue and restore sons and daughters back into a relationship with him as your heavenly father. First John 3 verse 1, see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Second Corinthians 6 says, I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Ephesians 1 verse 5, check, check this, someone's got to catch this today. God decided in advance. He decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. He decided in advance. He knew about all your stuff. He knew about your brokenness. He knew you would blow it. He knew about the pain you would experience. And he still decided in advance to send Jesus for you. And not to make you a church member, but to make you a son or a daughter of a good heavenly father. Come on, if you're grateful. If you're grateful, that's a good time. That's a good moment to give God some praise. So once again, if your heart is or has operated or is operating with a deficiency of love and affirmation, be reminded today that you are chosen, you are loved, you're a child of God, you're accepted into the family of God. It's not just any family, it's a royal family. And all of this because God is first a father. He's first a father. He has many roles, many descriptors, right? He is creator, he's ruler, he's judge, he's savior. And while each of these is true, the word of God reveals the primary motivation for these roles and functions is his heart as a father. He's first a father and he's a good father. He's, he's a creator, but he's first a father. 
First Corinthians 8 says, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. Colossians 1 says, for by him all things were created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, all things created through him and for him. And, and, and I don't know about you, but we need to fiercely hold on to and protect this truth that's being opposed, that's being minimized in our culture today. That God is, is creator. And is it possible that there's that many people in, in waves and in droves dealing with schemes of anxiety, fear, worthlessness, inferiority, insignificance? Is it possible that one of the root issues is the minimization of God as sovereign creator? And, and, and I don't know about you, but I, I believe the Bible and, and, I, and I choose to believe. If you wanna choose to buy into that lie, that you came from cosmic goo, that you evolved from primates or whatever be the case, that, then you, you have, have your way with that. But I'm just telling you today, I, I believe the word of God, which says that I was created on purpose for a purpose, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image, in the very image of a good God. And we gotta teach our children that and we gotta train them up to stand against the lies of the enemy and the lies of the world. And we gotta help them to answer that question. Who do you say that God is? He's my creator, he's my sustainer. He's the one who gives me life. He's the one who brought me back home into a relationship with him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Ephesians 1 verse four says, you gotta catch, someone's gotta catch this. Even before he made the world, God loved us, he loved you, and chose us, he chose you in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Even before he made the world, even before he created you, it says right there, he loved you and he chose you. He created you because he desired to know you. So he is indeed the creator. But we just read it right there in, in no uncertain terms. He's creator because he's first a father. Because he wants to, to know you. Because he, he desperately desires a relationship with you that goes beyond your head and begins to impact your heart. And the book of James encourages us, says, don't be misled, brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens who never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Watch, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word and catch this in God's creation. Watch, and, and, out, and we, speaking to you and I, out of all creation became his prized possession. Look at your neighbor, just tell him you're his prized possession. You're his prized possession. When you look at the stars in the sky and the ones that you can see are just a drop in the bucket for the, of the ones he actually created. The universe that's still expanding. And you see the mountains and the seas and the, all the things, the beauty, the grandeur, the splendor, the magnitude, the awesomeness of what God created. Don't forget. You are his prized possession and he created you. Before he created you, he loved you and he chose you. He's, he is creator, but before he's creator, he's first a father. He's judge, but he's judge because he's fa first a father. How do we know that if you're a parent and you're a good parent, there's actually... There's a call, there's a, there's a mandate, there's a responsibility for you to judge your children's behavior and to bring course correction and to bring discipline. And, and God operates this way towards us because he's first a father. And, and there, the enemy comes in and tries to bring confusion over the distinction between condemnation and conviction. And God operates by his spirit in the form of conviction, which is always trying to get us to step out of something harmful or inferior and step back into the fullness of his ways that lead to life. 
But the enemy comes and tries to beat you up with the hammer of condemnation. Here's the difference. Condemnation is trying to keep you in that place. Conviction is trying to get you back on track, running the race that God has outlined for you in faith. He, so he is judge, but he's first a father. He, 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 he's, he's not a prude. He's not trying to kill your fun. He's not trying to steal your joy. Everything that's in this book, the things that he warns you about, the things that he tells you to do, the things that he commands you not to do are all because he's first a father. I, I, I have, I'm blessed to have four kids. We are blessed to have four kids. That's an important distinction to make right there. I didn't, do, I didn't have much to do with that. It was, <laughs> she did a lot more, right? We're blessed to have four kids and I love to see my kids playing and laughing and enjoying themselves. And I've built them a playground, a swing set with a curly slide in the backyard. And I love to see our kids out there running around. We, I got a trampoline. I kind of created an area right there. And I love to see them running around. And, 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 and on those days, come on, who was grateful for some 60 degree days the other day? It felt like a heat wave in the Midwest, man. I saw you guys wearing your flip flops and your shorts and everything. It was 58 degrees. Break it out, right? But seriously, that's like 75 degrees warmer than it was just a week ago, right? So, um, you know, I... I our kids were outside running around while, while I'm in there doing my sermon prep or whatever. And I, I love to hear them. I love to watch them. I love to see them. And God's the same way, man. He, 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 wants, to, he wants to see you enjoying the life that he's given you. And the, he, he, he comes to give you abundant life. The enemy comes to, to steal and kill and, kill and destroy. But I love to see my kids playing. But, but every now and then, you know, I'll kind of be, be caught up in my busyness and my work or whatever right there. I don't know what I'm doing right here. I guess this is me typing at my computer. And, and I, if, I, if I kind of realize, like, I haven't heard them for a minute, I, I kind of, like, I go check on them. I get concerned. And if I walk outside and if I see the gate to our yard, the fence that we've built to kind of keep them in a safe environment, in a safe place where I, I love to see them running and jumping and playing and, and laughing and enjoying themselves. But if I see that that gate has been propped open, you better believe that I'm going to make a beeline to the front yard because the, the same sound, the same thing, the same place that I enjoy seeing them do within the confines that I've defined and I've prepared, the same activity can get you into a world of trouble and a world of hurt when you're doing it in the street. And that's what God's word is. It's the, it's the parameters of life. He says, you, you, you want to you wanna be blessed in relationships? Do it this way. You want to be blessed and protected? And, and you want to be blessed in sexuality? Do it this way. You want to be blessed and prospered in your finances? You do it this way. And, and when we get outside, when we get outside of the parameters or the boundaries, it, it just puts us in a perilous situation. You might not get run over, but there's a chance. And I don't know who I'm talking to today that you're, maybe you're realizing in some area of your life, you're, you've left the yard. And, and you're playing in the street or you're perilously close. And I don't know what that is. Maybe you need to go and delete that text thread. Maybe you need to ask God to give you the grace to end that chat or that private message or whatever it is. And, and, and it's not condemnation, it's just the conviction of God. He said, I, I'm judge, but I'm first a father. And, and all, my, all my word, my decrees are all just to kind of position you and posture you so that you can live a blessed life. He's judged because he's first a father. You know that some of us kind of struggle with that because we see God as legalistic or heavy handed, maybe because of the denomination or the way that you were raised up to see God. You know that he's just, he's heavy handed and he, God forbid you have any fun. And, you know, God forbid that Jesus comes back, you know, when you're watching a R-rated movie or something, you know. And you see God this way. And it, it, it reminds me of, a story that I once heard about a county judge and a businessman who became friends. They met in church and they became friends through a men's group. 
and they had busy lives, both of them, as they were going and doing the things that they were doing, the county judge and the, and the businessman, he was in construction. But they, they, they enjoyed playing golf together. So once every four to six weeks, in spite of their busy schedules, they would try to schedule a tee time to get together and play golf. And, and on this day that, that they were scheduled to play golf, the county judge was there kind of waiting for his friend and the businessman was in a rush because of a business engagement. And he, he did what none of us would do. He, he, was, he got a little heavy foot. He was speeding a little bit, going down the road to get to the golf course. And he saw the, the most dreaded sight, you know, the lights begin to turn and the siren on. And it's like, oh man, maybe he's going after someone else. But sure enough, he was going after the businessman. He pulled the man over and he issued him a citation for speeding and saw him about his day. The, the sheriff's deputy was kind and courteous and, and did his job well. And he went on to hook up with the, with the county judge to play golf. And he said, man, I'm sorry, I'm running late. I was already running late. And then I got pulled over by a sheriff's deputy and the county judge took an interest in it and said, hey, how, how'd they treat you? Were they courteous and respectful? He said, oh yeah, the guy was real great. He said, did he, did he give you a citation? He said, yeah, he did. And he said, well, were you really speeding? He said, yeah, I was. And the county judge said, uh, hey, why don't you give me that ticket and I'll take care of it for you. And how I many you know that's a good friend to have, right? Like, <laughs> and so he gave him the ticket and, and then just moved on, just had full confidence that his friend was gonna take care of it, right? I mean, why wouldn't you? It's the county judge. And a few weeks later, they bumped into each other in passing at church. And the businessman said to the county judge, he said, hey, thank you for dismissing that ticket for me. And the county judge said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, the ticket I got on the way to play golf with you a few weeks ago, I, I gave it to you. You said you'd take care of it. He said, yeah, you, you, but you just said I dismissed it. And he said, well, it, isn't that what you did? And he said, I didn't dismiss it. He said, I paid it. I paid it for you. And he said, well, I didn't, I wouldn't have given it to you if I knew that that's what you were gonna do. I just presume that because of the power that you had that you were going to dismiss it. And he said, he said, well, were you really speeding? He said, well, yeah. He said, well, what kind of judge would I be? If I dismissed it for you and I penalized the one over here. He said, I told you I would take care of it, but I never said I would dismiss it. I went and I paid it. And it's a good illustration of what God has done for you and for me. He's a just God, he's judge. But he loves us so much because he's first the father that he sent Jesus to pay the price. We pray it every week, to pay the price that I could never pay. But that was fully due me. I really was speeding. I really have lied. I really have lusted. I really have operated in greed or selfishness, pride, sin, and rebellion. I really had the thoughts. I really did the thing. The Bible says not one of us, there's not one of us that doesn't fit in that category. So a just God sent Jesus to pay the price. I don't know, maybe he could have just dismissed it, but, he's, but that's, that's, that's not who he is, it's not his nature, he's just. But aren't you thankful that Jesus paid it all? That Jesus paid it all. Would you stand to your feet this morning and as you're standing, do as I commonly ask you to do, would you ask God, just ask, say, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? What are you reminding me of today? What are you revealing to me today? What place in my heart is there a deficiency or a void that's held me back or hindered me from fully relating to or receiving from you in the way that you desire? On the basis of family, fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, What place was there something said or done or what place was there a, something that I needed to be said or done that wasn't done? That maybe you don't even realize that the reason that you, you deal with the doubt or the fear, the anxiety or the sin is still tied to that, that wound that was introduced, that part of your heart. And if that's you today, I'm just telling you that you could cease from your striving, you could cease from your searching and the things 
of this world and the people of this world looking to fill that place, to heal that spot. You could, you could cease from striving or searching. And right now today, it's my hope, it's my heart, it's my prayer, I believe it's my assignment today to speak over you in the name of Jesus. Fully deputized by the, the heart and the love of the Father. To speak and declare the, the Father's heart over you, the Father's love over you, the Father's acceptance over you, the Father's affirmation over you. In spite of all your stuff, He knew you were gonna blow it. And He still created you, He still chose you, He still chases after you. And maybe that's, that's you today, you're here and God's knocking at the door of your heart. You're here and it's not by accident, it's by God's sovereign design for your life. You didn't maybe know it was gonna happen today when you said yes to come to church with a friend or a neighbor or, or you drove by and you saw, what's this place all about? You didn't know that today was the day that you were going to be chased after, to be chosen, to be loved, to be found, to be seen, to be healed, forgiven, restored, and made whole back into a relationship with your heavenly Father. And so if you're here today, it's a free gift. You don't get good to get God. Remember what we read early, earlier? While we were still sinners, while we were far from Him, that's when Jesus came. And so if that's you, or maybe you're here today and you realize that you once knew God, loved God, maybe even served God, but you've drifted from Him. You've drifted from Him. For whatever reason today, you just, you know, you realize you're far from Him. And if that's you, Jesus told a story that the Bible calls a parable about a person like you who said, give me my inheritance. And he went and tried to do life in his own strength, but he came to the place that inevitably all of us do when we try to live that way, the end of himself, the end of his funds, the end of his friends or his so-called friends. And he said, he thought to himself, he said, maybe I could go back and my father would just allow me to be a servant once again in his house. He, the Bible says he came to his senses. What am I doing? And if that's you, posture of the Father towards you is the same as it was in the parable Jesus told. And welcoming that wayward one back as a servant was not good enough for God. That father, the Bible says, ran to the edge of his property. The son had just taken one step onto the edge of the property. The father was looking for, longing for, eagerly expecting that moment. He ran, he embraced him, put a, key, put a kiss on his forehead put a ring on his finger, put a royal robe on his back and called a festival for the entire community saying, we must celebrate for today my wayward one has come back home. And if that's you today, far from God, that's the heart of the Father towards you today. He's looking for, longing for, eagerly anticipating this moment. So that, that wayward one took a step. Here's what I wanna ask you to do. I want you to take a step. And not a physical step, we're not gonna call you out or make you come to the front, but I do want you to be bold enough to realize and recognize and respond in this way. If that's you today, you need to be forgiven. You need a fresh start, a new life, or you need to come back home. Would you lift your hand as high and as fast as you can towards heaven? And say, that's me. And say, that's me. I, I need to come back into the arms of my Father. I need to come back into a relationship with Him. That's me. I need to be forgiven. I need to receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And many precious people receiving that free gift are coming back home. And, and if you raise your hand, or no, no, one more moment, one more moment. I, you, if you guys are part of this church family, you guys know I don't do that often, but I just sense there's another person or two. One more moment to respond. God sees your heart, but I think it's important that you take a step, take that step, lift your hand. And if you lifted it, you can lower it. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna ask you to repeat a prayer. We're gonna ask you to pray a prayer, but we're not gonna ask you to pray it on your own. We're gonna pray it with you. We want you to hear the sound of a church family, brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, coming alongside you right from the start to show you our support, our love, our encouragement. And this is just a small way and a first way that you're gonna experience this. If you'll connect to us and start running your race 
for Christ in faith. We'll come alongside you, help you, disciple you, encourage you, counsel you. If you stumble like we all did in our journey of faith, we'll help you get back up and keep moving forward to the destiny, the purpose that God has for you on the other side of this monumental decision. So come on, church family, with some amazing people that are starting a new life in Christ today. Let's pray this prayer. Pray with some boldness. Repeat after me. Say, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price that I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you my life and I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, say it loudly, I'll never be the same. And then put your hands together. We better rejoice with all of heaven for these precious people who came home to Christ today. Man, I hope you know you're chosen, you're loved, you are a son, you are a daughter. When the enemy comes to lie, he did, if he did it to Jesus, you better believe he's gonna do it to you if you are the son of God. He tries to create those doubts and lies of insignificance, inferiority. Would you just do what Jesus did and just answer back to him? It is written. I am loved, I am chosen, I am redeemed, I am made new, made whole. I am part of the family of God. He adopted me, he chose me. And just shut the devil's mouth this week with the word of God and stand in the confidence of knowing that he's your father and he's a good father. Amen. Amen. Hey, I love you. I'm praying for you. Let's worship God one more time together and then we'll come and dismiss you.